Welcome back to Coach's Corner, everyone. And today's topic, we're going to be talking about stage control. You guys have probably heard this terminology thrown around a lot, especially on commentary. Bam is joining us once again. Welcome back, Bam. And a Let's go. And huh? Tony. Who? Bam. Of the people. He has arrived. Oh, he's here. That? He's back. That, dude, dude, is that the podcaster from the Larry Lur Lounge? <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> yeah, dude. he got abducted from Larry. So I know, dude. <laughs> real quick before we get into the topic, let's just go around the horn real quick. I want to know, kind of catch up with everyone. How you guys been doing? Bam, how you been doing, man? I know a lot of Street Fighter uh, Six grinding, right? Yeah, man, a lot of Street Fighter Six grinding, uh, a lot of work grind as well too. Getting a uh, project set up, you know, getting budgets for the next year so I can do some cool things for the for the scene. So, um, yeah, man. So, but it's been good. It's been it's been a lot. It's been hectic but you know what there's a light near the end of the tunnel so you know i'm happy about that what about you ramses uh just been been on a coaching grind as per usual it's been fun trying to start my youtube back up it's been a bit inactive for a few months i've been busy you know competing uh and now that i'm taking a break from competing i'm back on a youtube grind trying to grind some new stuff for competition when i get back to it so yeah just busy uh with all the stuff that a smash player can do I've been uh, on fire down here in Florida and then uh, gonna literally yeah <laughs> <laughs> gonna go to a much uh, cooler climate over in uh, the Nevada desert to work Evo as a TO there so I'm looking forward to that so hey. I'll be doing that pretty soon yeah and you uh, you were just TOing at CEO as well right yeah so CEO to Evo it's uh, nice to have a good it's like a month and a week apart so give me enough time for downtime nice nice and of course before we get into the topic if you guys enjoy the content make sure to like comment subscribe tell us what other topics you guys want to hear for future topics i know we usually do a lot of characters but we're trying to broaden our horizons here and go into general topics we know you guys really enjoy those general topics when we talked to have the we had the edge guarding episode and how to pick a pocket or you know all these other things or how to pick a main so yeah, let us know in the comments what kind of topics you guys want us to go over. And we're going to get into this topic, a very general Wait. topic. What's up? Charles, how have you been? Oh, yeah, me. Uh, I've been doing pretty good. I've been, uh, I've been <laughs> That's grinding, my goat. I've been grinding a lot of other games like TFT, Pokemon Unite, Street Fighter VI. So I've been playing a bunch of different games. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, I still keep up with Smash and stuff like that. But it is... It's so hard to play Smash online when I can play Street Fighter Six online. I'm gonna keep it a buck. That that True. online is it's so cool. too easy. Yeah, and I, you know what's crazy? I was playing more Smash online like not too long ago before Street Fighter Six came out. It's not even like it's horrible. It's definitely not the best of the best, but it's not horrible. So you can still grind and get a lot of information and improve and stuff. But Street Fighter Six online is just so godlike it's just so good so i've been having a lot of fun playing street fighter 6 and dabbling in some other games as well and of course keeping on the content grind that's the the main thing for sure for sure so yeah <laughs> let's get let's into get it. it stage control a very broad term i think the basement or like the base level is very easy to understand i think the very base level concept of it is the closer you are to center stage, the more stage control you have, right? But I do think the topic gets a little deeper when we talk about different stages, right? Like final destination stage control, I would say is pretty similar to something like a Smashville stage control where the, the very center of the stage is the most important, right? But then there's other stages like small battlefield where if you have the center stage, it's not as advantageous. Like it's still really strong, but then you can hide underneath platforms in the one concept that I always like to push around uh, students when I used to coach a lot on Metafy and just like public coaching back in like Smash 4 and stuff, I, I call it the avenue of approach. So there, there's probably a bunch of different ways you can look at this concept, but the, the way I like to see it is the avenue of approach and sorry for the audio listeners, but I'm going to use like some visuals, but my hand is the platform. So if you have a platform, you cannot do an aerial and go through a platform. Right. So you can't start your aerial and go through a platform, which means you have to fall through the platform and then do your aerial. Right. So you have to fall through the platform, then activate your aerial. Because of this, you have to go around the platform to essentially have an avenue of approach. So if someone's standing underneath a platform, 
they they are shutting down your avenue of approach vertically, right? So because of that, when you're falling on top of a platform, they can just preemptively throw out an aerial. And because they have a platform to stop your aerial from reaching you, then you're fine. There are some exceptions, Pyra down air, Ivysaur down air, like really big cloud down air. Like there are some disjointed down airs that can attack through a platform. It's a little bit risky, but so there's some characters that can kind of ignore this if they have enough vertical range to reach your characters through the platform. But because of this, platforms create these avenues of approach, which are usually on the sides of the platform. So you have to go like either underneath or completely above and around it, right? So these platforms and how they become obstacles is a very, very big deal when we're just talking about stages in general, but especially when we're talking about stage control, because if you if you just think having the center stage is the most advantageous spot, then you're wrong. Because being underneath the platform is very strong as well. And then there's also platform sizes, right? A PS2 platform mm -hmm. does it isn't a big isn't a big ceiling like a small battle hollow field, bastion or hollow bastion, right? <laughs> Jeez. And, yeah. Right, right. And then we have like the single platform stages like hollow bastion, like Smashville, right? And those get a little tricky as well because yes, they're both single platforms, but Hollow Bastion and Smashville are both very different stages when it comes to stage size. Smashville is a very small stage. And contrary to popular belief, a lot of people will be like, I mean, it, it's a two way street. Like, I feel like there's some people that are in the camp of like, oh, since Smashville is small, zoners don't want to be there. I think zoners are really strong, or like at least trap characters are really strong on Smashville. It depends on what kind of zoner you are, but like, I think Snake is strong on Smashville, right? Because you just put platforms on that center area and you don't have a lot of room to run away from these projectiles, you, right? So you they You put grenades grenades on the center area, right? Right, right. So yeah, essentially yeah. when the stage is smaller and there's a trap character that like, oh, my grenade affects X, uh, X percentage of the stage, right? That percentage becomes larger when the stage is smaller. Now, it it also depends on the matchup, right? Like if the stage is smaller than some of these boxing characters can get close to snake and stuff like that. So it depends on the matchup and there's a lot of things to consider, but essentially these zoning slash trap characters can, can control a bigger percentage of the map if the map is smaller. So that's another thing to take into consideration as well. And I think the most, to me, the most dangerous stage control is when we're talking like a final or a smash floor or a hollow bastion, where I think the, when the center of the stage is the strongest point of the stage, that's when it's dangerous. And that's when stage control is like snowballed even further because on PS2 or small battlefield, if you have center stage, your opponent can still hide underneath these platforms and kind of cut off some of your avenues of approach, right? So um, I'm a Fox main, so I'm gonna bring up a Fox example. Fox does not have good left and right drift, right? The, the horizontal drift, not great. The vertical speed of which he falls down is really good, but, because he does, because his vertical speed and his fall speed is so high, he's not in the air a lot. So that combined with the fact that he doesn't have good left and right drift, he when when you're hiding underneath a platform, you don't have to like go right to the center of the platform to avoid Fox, right? Because he can't drift in that well unless he's like running and then he does like a short hop there, right? Then he's come, th then he's you're forcing some kind of horizontal approach, but it's not as much of a vertical approach anymore. So that is very important when thinking about where you're positioning yourself against these characters and what parts of the stage you want to position. Because when we talk about stage control, realistically, your main goal is to figure out what part of the stage, if you position yourself at, is where you're the strongest, right? And that's the part of the stage you want to control. So understanding that the center is not always the best spot. It usually is the best spot, but it's not always the best spot. And there's certain characters that you can use and abuse this on, right? And then there's other characters that kind of don't give a fuck. Like Cloud kind of doesn't give a shit, right? Cloud has incredible left and right drift and he has incredible horizontal spacing with fair and back air. So if you're trying to use a platform to shut down Cloud from back airing you, newsflash, the back air is probably still coming and you probably still- It's have bigger to than it. a platform. It's bigger than the platform, right, exactly. <laughs> so understanding which matchups and which characters, like what tools you're trying to shut down with platforms, I think is my, biggest point here because when you talk about stage control the first thing in my opinion that you should think about is the the platform layout because the platform layout is going to change how the stage control is going to flow right 
So, Bam, what are your thoughts on uh, stage control? I guess like surface level thoughts. You're muted. Bam, you're muted. No. Sorry. Hey, All right. Okay, I'm, I'm here. Okay. I'm alive. I'm a well. <laughs> um, so I think one of the biggest things, right, is um, just a very general thing. I think a lot of times when people talk about stage control, it's uh, very easy. Like, obviously, we, we talk about, like, oh, being center stage, you know. Oh, great. Like, I mean, obviously, when you have a game that's kind of like a King of Hills type style, where it's like, all right, being center stage just seems to be, like, the most optimal, right? But um, I think it's funny because even though it seems like one of the easier things, when you are inco incorporating stages, um, when you are assessing uh, character strengths and all those kind of things, um, you fall into situations where you start to realize it can be a, a little bit more complex than like most people will, will take a grand for. And also, I think when, it, when we are tying that into stages, a lot of people are really bad at choosing stages. Part of it is because of just like simply what people do because... Hey man, um, we come from like you know, start grassroots. You know, is a, a lot done with not necessarily uh, competition being priority. So someone, you know, oh, I'll just go to PS2. Oh, I'll do this. You know, whatever, right? And not really thinking about how impactful it is. Um, in Smash, stages are so impactful in comparison to any other like like, and honestly, just like platform fighters, right? In comparison to a traditional fighter, let's say it doesn't really matter for anything really, right? Um, Except uh, you know, third strike. Shout out to the the table and third strike, the goaded <laughs> the goaded table, man. Um, but like you know, like a, it, besides those kind of uh, you know niche situations, um, it's just very important. So to me, it's something that a lot of people can get better at. I've seen a lot of matches lost, um, almost at the stage select screen, as it were, uh, and it's like understanding that in tandem with what our advantageous spaces on the stage for your character versus certain characters is just so important and easily can easily boost anyone's game if you just understand those things right where to stand and why so yeah i'm excited to talk through this topic because i do think it's something that a lot of people just kind of like gloss over and you know the thing that when it talks when you talk about character growth and like or player growth rather a lot of people just you know combos combos or like do this cool thing or whatever it's like dude there's so much you can get just from knowing position <laughs> and position is going to be contingent on you know uh, understanding those like nuances so yeah grab this so something that i always talk about is that i think it's very powerful to simplify smash in ways that are insightful but not too complicated right and there's like a, a balance between a simplification that's meaningful um while still uh being effective efficient uh, uh, you're able to simplify in this way in real time and act on it in a way that makes sense and when i think about stage control the simplification that i think about is that well first of all a lot of interactions in smash you can either categorize as an inter like like a result of time right so early aerial late aerial um, and a lot of uh, interactions you can categorize in terms of space. So like overshoot, space dwell, et cetera. And so stage control, mostly a space re uh, related topic. And then within that space, we can also kind of categorize micro and macro. And stage control to me is very much a, a macro space decision. And, you know, as you guys have said, most of the time you're trying to, you know, hold on to center, push your opponent in the corner. Um, the thing that I think is powerful about space that makes people underappreciate the effects of stage control is that stage control really only activates if you consistently decide to prioritize stage control. Because imagine you're playing as a Pulsena and she's Becker walling you, and it's very hard to punch the Becker. But after the Becker, she doesn't really have any buttons to press, right? She doesn't have like great ground follow-ups. What a lot of Palutena players will do is she will back air and then dash back to stay safe. And the best, well, let's put it this way, the, the safest way, most consistent way to punish this is to just take the space that she gave you by dashing back and just walk her into the corner. But this idea of walking her into the corner it is a choice you're making on a micro level, right? So the individual interaction is I'm going to take stage control that only really takes effect if you do it multiple times at a micro level, because a single dashback, it's not going to be that rewarding. It only really gets rewarding when she stops having the room to actually dash back, 
right? So it's a decision that if we take every single interaction, every micro bit of micro in the game, if we take it individually, it is actually like a really bad punish. We just take some stage. You're better off take like like guessing and kind of like getting information. But if we think about it on a macro scale, it leads to an well, not an inevitability, but but an eventuality of Paltena being in the corner. And so what stage control is really powerful for, in my opinion, is that it allows you to contextualize micro decisions in a macro environment, which allows you to get more insight in not just what your opponent is trying to do in the individual interaction, but what their strategy is on a whole. And what you often find, so when I tell my students, hey, you should be focusing on stage control more. When Tony told me, hey, you should be use, focusing on stage control more. Um, what I realized is that there's two types of people. Well, there's three types of people. One, people who do not care about stage control. If that is the case and you focus on stage control, you've basically won, right? There's, you know, like you're making a decision that they are not making at all. That's just a victory. Um, two, there are people who use stage control in one specific way. So for example, the Paltena who beckers and dashes back. If they're doing the same thing, again, they're not making a choice, you've already won. And then three, there's people who actually make stage control related choices. And if that is the case, you better be making that choice as well, because if you're not, you're the one who's gonna be losing out. So I think this combination of macro and micro is really what makes stage control so important. So if you wanna talk about space on a micro level, just as an aside, is more so related to ranges, right? So we're thinking like, okay, this is like close range, this is mid range, this is long range. Mm -hmm. And then we look at that distance, me and the opponents at a micro scale. But as you can see, me and the opponents does not include the stage. So part of it is micro, part of it is macro. And I think one of the best things you can do for your own gameplay is really reflect like how much is my micro affected by my macro and how much is my macro affected by my micro? Because once those two elements start interacting with each other, I think that is really where you get to the next level. What do you think, Tony? So the way I tend to look at it is it's like trying to find cover on a rainy day. So generally, there's you and your opponent, and usually you want to be dry and you want them getting wet. So to uh, look at it that way, we want to view it as essentially risk reward. Now, you could always just go to the center of whatever roof covering you can find, and you're going to be driest there, except whenever you do that, your opponent will be able to get dry. And so then it turns into essentially the king of the hill style game that Smash actually is. So then at that point, both of you who are dry want to push each other out into the rain. And so usually the optimal position is, as Charles mentioned, uh, you want to be right at the edge of the awning so that they can't enter the dry space. And so essentially you want to be under that platform to close off things like their full hop ins, limit their approach options. And then from there, sometimes it's worth getting your sleeve a little wet if it means that you know for sure that they can't quite reach you out. And so that's where you get into things like you don't want to be dead center under platforms, even if it's on Smashville, because you can't quite push them out because they can find a little bit of roof for themselves. And then likewise, uh, once you're comfortable and you just got a little bit of a wet sleeve but they're out in the rain, you can also just hold that. The problem then is if you're only picking one place for the same amount of time, that's two different criteria that your opponent's going to be able to read you. And like Ramsey said, you have to make a choice. If you're not making choices, or rather if you're making the same choices every single time, then your opponent's going to be able to predict you with reasonable consistency because all of a sudden you're now making the same choice every single time. You're going to go to the edge of the awning and stick your sleeve out. And so sometimes if you want to drown somebody, you got to go to the beach. And so sometimes you just got to push them out and go into the rain yourself, but you push them into the pool, give them a little swirl Holy in there. shit. So... <laughs> Yo, this analogy is going this ham. Is, this is this is an Amer American I analogy. Holy oh, moly! Let's go, you have to wait. Yo, that was the one You have to wait. Talk to him, Tony. Let him know, man. Let him know. So once we get to the beach, sometimes you want to take the umbrella, and that's where characters like Snake, of course, you can put out your grenades, your explosives, your up smashes, because then the opponent can't go to that part of the stage without getting you, and so you can still keep yourself a little bit dry while pushing them back into the water. And so mm -hmm. that's generally how I relate these things on a more practical level. Uh, you can Very practical. <laughs> very practical. Uh, drowning <laughs> <opponent>. <laughs> <laughs> CEO is crazy, bro. 
Yeah. What was that? <laughs> Daytona. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you do at a CEO, bro. <laughs> the, uh, so there's multiple umbrella points that you can essentially pick and it's not just the platforms but sometimes it's being on top of platforms and so usually actors want to be under the platform because of the relationship charles mentioned where it closes off their ability to mix up fast falls and regular falls for timing so usually just cover the fast fall and then if they regular fall uh, they're going to land on the platform and you're protected anyways so with that said uh what center really is and why it's so important is because center is ultimately a crossroads. So if you are wanting to go from one rooftop to the other, or rather under them, generally you have to walk out into the rain a little bit. And so what center is, is it's the area between the two roofs so that you can be under a roof and keep that edge, but you're not staying under the same roof. And so even while maintaining center control, there's two different, slightly off-center places you can be that allows you to protect that roof while still retreating backwards so that your opponent can't whiff punish you if you're putting something up preemptively to protect it. And so the idea is if you're just swatting at people, it's very easy. You just wait for them to swat and then you smack them back. But if you're swatting at somebody while then moving to the other side of the roof, worst case scenario, you both get dry for a little bit. And so as long as you're keeping yourself dry and following on to the next point, even if you're starting all the way back from the beach, at the end of the day, when we look at who's the wettest person on the field, it's almost always going to be your opponent. And so that's just the most simple way that I can think of off the top of my head for it. Uh, I think Ramsey's did a nice job breaking it down systemically. It's really down to a matter of risk reward. And it's a matter of figuring out which system your opponent's using and then using that against them to either predict them or to try and outmaneuver them as they follow you to the dry spots. Yeah. Uh, I love uh, both you. Uh, I mean, honestly, all three of you guys, your explanations on like uh, stage control. Cause I, I think that that's something that gets passed off um, all the time. I know I, I've talked about this briefly when we were talking about edge guarding, but a very similar thing applies where, um, the concept of like rebounding in basketball, right? And how a lot of times people think, oh, I just need to be close to the basket. As long as I'm close to the basket, then I'm perfectly fine. And it's like, no, actually, when you're someone who's a good rebounder, they're making sure that they are properly positioned between their opponent and the basket. Mm -hmm. That is the key point, not just being near the basket. Because if I'm just near the basket, they can stand right next to me, be near the basket, and now it's a coin flip, right? Wherever that bounces versus like, I am preventing you from being there. So no matter where the ball bounces, I'm still going to be a better place because I'm in front of you, right? And like it's like those kind of, that simple concept, right? It, it seems, it, it, a lot of times it eludes people because they just think, I just need to be here. And they're not taking into account their opponent and their objective of keeping someone out there. And if you're trying to keep someone out, to go back to your um, your analogy, right? We were talking about something like, if you're trying to keep someone at the house, standing in the center of the house is not going to keep them outside the house if the door is open. They're going to walk right in, right? Like that, that doesn't make any sense. You got to be there at the door and be like, what up? I'm not letting you through. And that's like, it's such a big thing, right? And that's really where you start to see um, like state control like that just take form. But I just wanted to say, like, yeah, all, all three of you guys, just great explanations all around for that. And I, I do hope that as everyone's listening, like, really start, like, hammering that home, right? That it's not just center because that is literally, that's, like, st st literally stage one of a very encompassing, like, topic that, again, to what Ramsey was saying, like, if you actually aren't even trying to, aren't even considering that part of the game, like, you're just getting bopped. You're doing this and that and trying to do all these mix-ups. I'm like, I just can't get in. It's like, yeah, because they have the higher ground, bro. Well, it don't matter, dude. You can be dumb like Anakin, man. Get cut up, dude. Get get chopped. Right? Get you got in, yeah, lava. in lava. In lava. Yeah, in lava, bro. <laughs> in lava. Yo, forget the rain. In the lava. <laughs> like, what? It's That's crazy, ash. you know? Yeah, bro. You know, what, no, you know what that. Don't be like but, Anakin, man. For real, building on, like, what Tony is saying as well as what Bam is saying, because... I think what is was interesting is is that yeah like the starting point is you you control the center right but the reality is you should control how your opponent is trying to get the center so what tony said is like you got to figure out the system that they use so there are players uh so in my region there's siski siski does not care about center 
bro plays Samus. Like he just wants to get room, sets up his little, you know, like his, his little zone under the platform. Um, we didn't so go the anomalies when, yet. The anomaly character. Yeah, the anomalies. Woof. Um, Snake. <laughs> Sonic. No, but uh, Sonic. Uh, but especially for, for, for a character like Samus, who also has a good recovery, so it's not that bad if you get hit off stage, right? Um, I'm going to be focusing not on, on controlling center, but on what I can get out of center, right? So there's always like steps. There's, there's like the, the situation creation, and then there's a the situation capitalization. And if you can identify what situation you should create in the context, so like, should I be defending center? Should I be waiting for them to aggress to center? Should I be interrupting them before they can set up pressure on center? Should I be mixing up the fact that I'm in center at all, right? That's like the creation. And then from there, once you have created the situation you want, you also need to think like, how am I gonna capitalize on it? And I think that is where uh, the systems like, Tony said, you got to figure out, like, how is your opponent thinking about center? And it's not like it's not like, you know, you're trying to read their mind. It's just like, what are they doing? What's the data I'm giving? And based on that, you take a, you know, you take an educated, ed educated guess at, at how they play decision control. Um, and once you get to that point, what you're basically doing, um, and this is something that I think um, especially Tony would agree with, um, you're trying to predict how they move, right? And, and like Bam said as well, you got to predict the path that they're taking uh, because the point that you see your opponent at is never the point that they really are because of you know how reaction time works right so you see your opponent at location by the time you see that they're already at a different spot and by the time they act you act on it they're already at a way different spot so a lot of the time what makes stage control so complex is that you know there's like a few rules like you know center is good which could be subverted then there's uh, you know human limitations like reaction time. Uh, then there's limitations of your character like how do you how do you hit movement right like what tools do you have to defend or aggress? And then there's also like okay well how how is my micro right? So if I'm defending center, am I doing that in close quarters? Am I doing that from a longer range? Am I doing that from? And then there's a layer of information right? So like may, I'm playing I don't know Sephiroth. I want to stay at the mid range, but this guy has figured out what I want to do in the mid range and I figure out what he does at the close range. So I'm playing close range Sephiroth. Maybe you're playing as like Ridley or something who was also about at close range, right? So there's like a lot of different variables that make it so that there's never really like a right answer. And that's what I think is the most important thing to convey is that there's a lot of heuristics that we can use to approximate proper stage control, but there, it's never like control center. There's always a lot of nuance to it. And I think the best thing you can do is try it out with an idea, right? So like, this is what I think is good for this reason. Try it out and then reflect. Was that reasoning correct? Did I act on it properly? Is there more to it that I didn't consider? And if you just repeatedly do that, eventually you will approximate like an actual, like, like a system that works for you. Yeah, yeah. And I think also understanding the safe points of stages is very important, kind of piggybacking mm -hmm. off of my previous statement with platforms and like how how different stage control becomes with no platforms, with two platforms, with one oh, yeah. platforms, with three platforms, with sometimes two platforms and there's no platforms. Now there's three platforms like town and city, right? Like town and city is a stage that is the stage control is constantly rotating, right? And there's, when I talk about a, like a safe place, there's a lot of safe places, quote unquote, that you can go onto the stage to reset resources. And usually with these kinds of safe places, they're, I, I consider them high platforms. So the top uh, platform on Battlefield is a very safe place, quote unquote, uh, to reset platform or to reset your resources as long as your opponent is not as long as they don't know how to abuse their stage control, right? Because we were talking about the base concept of stage control. Now we're going to start getting into like, why, you, like, what do you actually get from stage control, right? And if someone's controlling center really well, and if someone's in the corner, the reason why stage control is strong is because you get corner situations. And in the current meta, a lot of these top players, they're not being too risky on edge guarding, even though, you know, in our previous or one of our previous episodes about a year ago we talked about the offstage meta and how we think it's very underdeveloped we think uh, players could get a lot more off it but i mean frankly right now just what what the top players are doing right now is they're taking very safe bets they take characters that are extremely safe look at swargo playing cloud and, and swargo does go off stage with cloud a, a good amount but the main win con for spargo is stage control snowball the stage control into a corner situation because cloud is very fucked up in the corner because he's hitting you with back air he can go into a block string with forward tilt or he can set up another jump you have to respect cloud back air 
whether it's spaced or not, that's the fucked up thing. Like if it's spaced, no fucking way. If it's not spaced, maybe if you parry, you can do something. But like for the most part, you still can't do shit. So uh, this strategy of stage control really, really caters to characters that have very strong corner pressure and get a lot off the corner. Why is that? Because corner in, in a corner situation, you are... I. It, I used to think of it as a minor form of disadvantage, but in today's meta, it feels like it's starting it's to major. become a major form of disadvantage oh, because yeah. of how strong players are and how safe it is. When you go off stage for an edge guard, there are a lot of characters that you can make safe scenarios, but it's generally a riskier scenario. The general concept of edge guarding is higher risk, but you get a higher reward. I can get your stock at 30% against like a cloud or any sword character if I get that double jump, if I read the double jump or if I react to the double jump, right? So there's... Higher risk, higher reward, but with stage control and corner pressure, it's lower risk, but or it's lower risk and a pretty good reward. Like it, it like it, it's so and it's sweet. consistent and it's very consistent. Yeah, like cloud back to edge guarding is less consistent yeah. as fuck. And like especially when your character is getting the stock, and even like a character like Fox, extremely powerful when hitting you with back here in the corner. And there's so many different mix ups that you can do from that. So because of this, you now are starting to understand like okay i want stage control because i want the corner right but you like like rams has said it's not like what you hit center stage you plant your feet in center stage you're like all right ah where where's my corner scenario bro give it to me like i i want my back airs hitting you and i want like now that i'm center stage you have to go all the way to the ledge over there it doesn't work like that it's it's a it's it's a game of king of the hill like tony said right like you guys are both fighting for that right to push the other person into the corner so it's the more you, the more you get into it the more it's like okay how do i prioritize center how much do i prioritize it how does how much does my opponent prioritize for uh for center okay we both want center right because then there's some people that don't give a fuck about center and then you got to play a whole another game right but if you guys both want center how does this player fight for center does he like run in with hitboxes does he you know set up explosives right or does he does he use range does he using mid-range right there's so many different tools that you can fight for center stage does he like kind of fight for it but then retreats to the platform there's so many different things and there's some players that they'll have center stage but they don't know what to do with it like i'll like if you're playing somebody and they're they have center stage control and you can reset on the top platform of battlefield or town and city every single time and they're not going to abuse their center stage control and like hit you for it or at least contest you on those things that's something to note right what does your opponent do with said stage control what do you do with said stage control what scenarios are you trying to set up right because if if your character doesn't need center stage like if you're playing sonic or maybe even samus you don't need the center stage you you still have x amount of pressure right i still think samus players could do a better job at fighting for center stage. i, I agree don't think they, i don't think they necessarily have to just run to the corner uh, it's a luxury center is a luxury for them yes right i mean luxury. and I, I think it's also just like I mean, when we talk about uh, controlling center, you don't have to necessarily be in the center to control center, right? That's also another aspect too, right? Not just with the traps, but if you are in range of that, right? To go into the uh, well, analogy that we were talking about before, right? Going back to the house, right? If I have a, like, a range tool to hit somebody if they're coming to my house, I don't need to stand right next to the door and then they come up on me and then have a challenge when I can abuse my range still cover the door but not be in the door right yeah these analogies are, it's analogy day all right we're going Sephiroth, crazy. Sephiroth stabbing yeah, yeah. you from the kitchen just you don't need to be over there right i can stay back and i can still that door is still mine i'm out here i'm just bobbing I'm, i don't care what they're trying to do to me right and like but those things are a really big factor because sometimes we're just like oh just because they're not standing there means that they're not controlling that or they're not thinking about that. Uh, not necessarily, right? It's like because you can have tools that can still cover that space unless you're still in control. Just it's just like for that character, you're like you're farther away, like more indirect, right? In that sense. Um, but those things still nonetheless like very, very important. Um, and then other times, like you uh, to you guys' point, sometimes you'll get a situation where it's like a, a Samus or a ranged character. And because in their head, they're just like, I want to use all this stage as possible. So I'm going to go all the way back, right? And the problem with that at times is just like, you have slowly and surely someone's getting through, getting through. And like, yes, you can cover and kind of control stage right in the center. But the reverse side of the coin there is when you're at such a far range, um, a lot of times, even for solid zoners, 
that time is enough that, that goes into your reaction time right now it's like if you're shooting something from way over there dude i got a billion years to think about it i i, I could be i could be 85 95 i could be hitting triple digits man old man reactions and still be able to react to that because you're so far right so what are you giving away from going going to that distance that's another aspect there you know for, and that's why like a lot of times see you'll see when it's like when p- donors they'll be dangerous it's like yeah you're going to be far but you want to be close enough where it's still the stuff is a little bit harder to react to still, right? Where you're still in the vein where you have those mix-ups there. Um, so that's why it's like the purpose of you just going, all, I'm going to go all across stage. It's like, dude, now I can just react to this stuff. So guess what happens? I'm probably just going to get end up going to getting the middle, middle of the stage for free, right? And then I have to, then I actually have to challenge you. And then if you fail there, you have nowhere to run. And I have a place where I can challenge you, right? So understanding those nuances between your characters, especially for zoners, is a big one as well. And that's, I think, the the thing that I'm really getting from the perspectives here is that, like, there's so many paradigms where stage control is a factor. Reactability, safety, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And the biggest one, in my opinion, uh, or one that comes up a lot is is just like your control over how many situations you can make. And if you're in the center, yep. you can you can move in every direction. So mm-hmm. in other words, like we said before, you see your opponent in a position. By the time you act on that, they're in another position. If they're in the center, that position, like those positions, it's like a, it's like a bubble around the character, right? Yeah. But if they're in the corner, you can half that bubble. That's powerful. That's yes, powerful. And and because you can really limit where your opponent can be. You can then force interactions, and because you have a lot of situations that you can create, they will struggle to interact with you properly. And that's where Cloudbacker becomes powerful. So, like a lot of tools, Cloudbacker, Paul Tay, not Becker, Roy Nair, uh, Steve Tilt, right? Like all these characters, once they interact with you, even if it's like a shield or, uh, you know, like whatever, like they win by just getting your location. Once they have the location, generally they're fine. And how you beat characters, like when you're fighting against Ryu, what are you doing? You're dashing back. When you're fighting against Cloud, what are you doing? You're probably staying outside of short hop back air range, and then you're making a read on when he jumps, right? So like these plans are so contingent on having the room to retreat. And when you stop having that, that is what that's why it's such a major disadvantage. And 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 that's like if we look at metas, metas always progress from like a micro focus, because once you understand the micro, it's kind of like your puzzle pieces. And only when the puzzle pieces are fully developed, can you make the puzzle? Can you get the strategy going? And now that people understand the puzzle pieces, now the strategies come up. And now that the strategies are more important, in other words, the situations you create are a priority over how you play them out. That is when the degree to which you can create situations, in other words, how strong corner is, is such an important thing. And um, one thing that uh, Mahi, I don't know if you guys, guys know Mahi. He's a melee player from France, one of the best in uh, Europe. I don't know if he still plays, but when he played, he was one of the best. I talked to him once, and what he told me, and this was, I think, like 10 years ago. He said... Um, melee knowledge he said stage is a it, 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 it's like a super meter it's like a resource and you can decide to either spend it to be safe but the risk of that is that once you're out of meter you're in a corner it's kind of like drive gauge in street fighter 6 right you can spend it to be stronger but once it's gone you're a lot weaker and so you have to take some risks to regain your resource and i think this perspective really stuck with me over the years because now that category categorization that i do between like space and time the way i look at space the way i look at time is that they're resources we have a limited amount of time we have a limited amount of space you have to invest them in the proper way and that's also why when dealing with these topics what i recommend is like have some idea like why are you investing this space? Why are you investing this time? And that's going to allow you to improve way more in the long term than just like kind of like trial and error through uh, through like individual situations. So I think one of the ways we can look at stage control is the idea that certain positions are more. And by that, I mean, we can actually get it as smash in general as a game in which it's by being on certain points in the map. And so Could just like you would in a king I apologize. Uh, I said we can treat it like a king of the hill game in other games in which you accrue points for being on the king or on the hill, but because there's multiple spots, not every spot gives you the same amount of points. 
And you also don't just want to be on a single spot either. As I mentioned before, if you stay in the same spot, you're predictable. So think of it as like posture. You want to shift postures from place to place or else you're going to get strained and you're going to hurt yourself. So the idea is you want to figure out your first, your second, your third best places. And you want to spend as much time on those places as possible while having a plan on how you're going to rotate between these places. So if we are learning the game, then the first thing we want to do is probably learn what we're going to do. This is your buttons, your combos, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing you want to do, though, before you even learn movement, is where you want to be for these. It doesn't matter that you can execute platform combos if you don't know that you're supposed to be under a platform in order to get a platform combo. So before you learn movement, you have to know where you're moving to and where you're moving from. You need to know that you want to move from a place because you're at a, a place that doesn't earn you as many points as if you were, let's say, two steps to the right. And so what we want to do is we want to look at our matches because this isn't a set number of places. It's not like we have the golden XY coordinates on. This is where every matchup is supposed to be, even for individual characters. As Bam mentioned, there's a tension between wanting to be spaced relative to your opponent and be spaced relative to the stage. So essentially there's three actors on the game. There's the stage and each player. And then on top of that, there's matchups where you can introduce other factors like Pac-Man Hydrant, for example. Yep. There, yep. These are also relative spaces. So you have to ask yourself, what's more important that I be closer to one target or closer to a different target? And then there's different values for each because if you're further from something, it means that you're gonna have more time to react to that thing moving but that might not necessarily be what you want. Maybe you want that thing to have less time to react to you. And so this also goes down to the tension between proactive and reactive elements, mm -hmm. because sometimes you want to react to something. Sometimes you want them to not be ready to react to you. And just to simplify this, this could be whether you and your opponent both want to dash attack each other. Then the question of, well, who wants to dash attack first is in flux. And so that, answer can also change based on other contexts in the match. Like let's say one of you is landing from something else. And so the other player is plus two or plus three and the dash attacks are normally the same speed. Then the person who's slightly plus, if they dash attack now and they both dash attack, they're going to win what would normally be a trade. And so there's always floating contexts that change these. And so where the skill really comes in is being able to recognize these positions speed while also, as Ramsey's mentioned, kind of leading your shots, knowing that because you can't react quickly because of the input delay, because of your natural human system, you are always going to be a little bit behind. And so you have to actually recognize these windows that are too fast for you to react to in real time. You have to recognize that these windows are coming up and basically jump through a hoop before it even exists and time things so that these are going to come up. And so ultimately stage control comes down to reacting to a dash attack when we really get down to it. Yep. Like everything, everything leads into everything else. It's, it's very cool stuff in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Especially reacting to dash attacks or playing within a range of a dash attack. A lot of that is the backbone of corner pressuring. Uh, there's some characters that are hard to corner pressure and because of that, they demand a little extra respect and it really comes down to burst options, right? When you're cornering Fox compared to cornering, you know, Robin, that's two very different dash attacks. Those are two very different burst options you're playing around. Mm -hmm. You can probably play a little, a lot closer to Robin than you can to Fox because Fox could just say fuck it and yellow out the dash attack at any given moment. And if you're under a platform or something like that, that could be 80 damage you take, right? Like the, the, the risk reward is highly in favor of Fox. I wouldn't say Fox is necessarily in the advantage in that specific scenario, but there are things you have to respect and you can abuse that to even like slow roll your, I like to call it slow rolling your way out of the corner where you like walk, you don't really like mm. run or anything. And you, you, you have to pick up on, Oh, Hey, my opponent is really respecting my dash tech. I'll even throw out a couple lasers as Fox. I'm like, damn, you're like hella respecting me. Like here, take two damage for that. And then I'm going to walk in or something. Right. So yeah. it, it really comes down to, in my opinion, cornering and especially with stage control, I think that what separates the good from the great from abusing stage control, because the, the concept of stage control is very, very simple. Applying stage control and what players get out of it are two totally different worlds. Uh, for example, yep. Spargo or Leo, like some of these sword specialists that we have in the upper echelons of play are extremely, extremely strong at stage control. And especially 
pre-quarantine, nobody came close to how good Leo was at stage control. It is, oh, yeah. I think, one of the big things that Leo, it clicked for Leo in the very beginning of Ultimate. And I, I think it's one of the many reasons why he was so dominant. He really understood stage control. He really understood how important it was. And he really understood how important it was to not get reversal not like hit reversal but positioning reversal this is something that now a lot of players know and understand and they don't let that happen but i would say pre-quarantine leo was one of the few players that like really understood that positioning to the point where it was like leo would get a hit center stage and the reason why being positioned center stage is so strong is that you are the farthest away from the blast zone as possible so if you get hit at mid percent at center stage you're not off stage you're like probably right by the ledge like you're you're probably the next scenario is probably a corner scenario you get hit at 50 percent right by the ledge you're in an offstage scenario Uh oh this is way worse than what i previously said right so understanding that concept and then also understanding the concept of when someone gets hit they it is a very natural instinct to be like oh fuck i just got hit i want to go for like the greedy option like what if what if i burn my most important resource but then i'm in center stage but you're not in center stage no more this is something Leo the dream. Covered. Yeah, that <laughs> that's yeah. the dream. Yeah. The American <laughs> you heard the, the American, American Air Dodge. Dream, that's the American dream. That's it. Yeah. Burning yeah. every single resource and just getting everything for it. Right. Yeah. So you want to shut down this option and you really want to make your opponent pay for this option. And this is something that stage control, prioritizing stage control in scenarios not only in neutral, but when you get the hit, if you play your game to be like, okay, I'm gonna cover a greedy double jump for a positional. Uh, advantage right like the, my opponent's trying to positionally reversal me not necessarily with a hit just position wise so like a double jump or something like that right so if you position for that and if they just drift away to the corner you get a corner scenario right like you still have all the stage you have the corner they land on a platform cool you can platform pressure them so if they don't double jump you're still fine and you're playing out of range of a swing so you're impossible for you to get hit right but if they double jump oh fuck like it, you you're going for like a win or i'm like taking your stock like a win or a super it's min win max scenario. right right mm -hmm. like it's not even a win win yeah. it's like win super win scenario because if you hit them out of their double jump now they're like pretty fucked. now you can go all in on an edge guard or a juggle or go for some big read if you want or you can keep hedging your bets to be like okay in this scenario i got the hit there is no way i don't have stage control after the scenario is done and that is something that sounds very simple, but it can very, be very hard to do in the heat of the moment. A lot of players, when you get a hit, you want to hit your opponent more. It's a very natural feeling. Pressing any kind of buttons and using your hitboxes in any type of game is essentially what you want to do for the most part, right? So, some other players have different play styles and stuff, and they might like to play like zoners and stuff. But even zoners, you still mm -hmm. want to zone people out with the button that you're zoning with, right? It, it's a good feeling. Yeah. Right? It is a very natural feeling to do that. And uh, kind of like fighting that feeling and going for the macro play of like i'm gonna make the macro decision and no matter what i have stage control after this yeah. hit i might not get another hit afterwards but i could get another hit if my opponent's greedy but if my opponent's not greedy i still have center stage and i could probably corner them or get them closer to the corner so you have to to really snowball your stage control you have to make very stage stage control decisions right like over and over again. Mm -hmm. It can't just be like two in a row. Like the reason why Spargo and Leo are so good at this is because they make the stage control decision nine out of 10. Every single eight time. Eight out of yeah. 10 times, yeah. right? And then maybe sometimes they'll go, like Spargo will go for that wild double jump back air that he yeah. usually, like he'll catch you off. And they're with. doing it so quickly too, right? That's a yes. whole nother thing as well. They do it at such a, like such a crazy speed. We're like going back to what uh, Randy was talking about and, um, you know, Randy and Tony as well, where, the idea is like if you're not making that decision, right? But I'm thinking about that, like you're already jammed, like you've already lost, right? And sometimes these guys are doing it so fast that people aren't even like by the time they realize what's taking place, the time to make it's that decision is done. That pop quiz is over. You're yeah. screwed. You didn't turn in anything. You got it's a zero. quick time event. It's a quick exactly. time event. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's definitely Q2E. A a absolutely. Absolutely. They're already writing and, up the um, next quiz. Yeah, it's like it, you didn't even yes, realize you failed yeah. the first one. Yeah, <laughs> what, what's wrong with you? You're not graduating at all. Like you know, like it's it's crazy. Um, but real quick, I feel like Tony, you were you're gonna say some things, but I just wanted to add in something really quick. Um, also too, I think that part of the evolution of this as well, when you're talking about corner and you're talking about we talked about like the American dream when everyone's just like, man, 
if I just burn all my stuff, I can get back to where I was and everything will be fine. And right? I'm in a and better position than I was. Exactly. And then they just get bopped and they lose, right? But on the reverse side of the coin, you have people, it's like, okay, I do want to get back to where I was, but I'm not going to burn this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be patient. I know I need to be patient. They're looking for something as well. And like, guess what? I'm going to hit them with the side switch combo, right? And we've seen a lot more people get more proficient at those particular things where it's like, yeah, I'm in disadvantage, but I understand these are the kind of things you're looking for, but I have in my repertoire where if I hit you here, usually if I hit you here, oh, you go to center stage and uh, yeah, you got hit, but guess what? You know what? <laughs> I'm just okay. Versus now you get people like Tweak Oh, I'm on the I'm on I'm I'm chilling here. I'm ramming the ledge. Oh, I hit you with mana. Oh, well, I side switch and I did a forward smash and I just killed you right now. Get reversal and not reversal into center stage, get reversal into death. Hold that, right? And so it's like you also have to recognize that from your opponent. Do they have that in their repertoire? Do they have that in their toolkit? Right? Um, because when you do, then you gotta play that very differently. Yes, you still have an advantage when you're pressuring them according to that situation, but you got an extra thing you got to account for because this person might hit you with the freaking the switch of room. Next thing Politana you know, get inside the throw. house. Yeah. 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 The back classic. throw too, right? Yeah. The mm -hmm. traditional, right? Back throws where it's like, oh man, I'm in corner. Oh, be gone. Off into the ether, right? So those are also additional factors. Um, despite you being in a position where you have great stage control, you have to take like those kind of opponents, right? Those characters and those kind of opponents who do have that in their repertoire very dangerous right and that's very powerful um when you have actual uh counter options to being pressured um you know with someone who has some stellar uh, stage positioning but i just wanted to add that in as well so the way i tend to look at the stage positioning is that it's largely based around what bam is referring to so uh, essentially you have the risk and reward of various hits and reversals and so usually what you want to do is you want to look at what the biggest reward that each player can go for from each position. Because sometimes all you got to do is you just got to burn all your resources and just go straight for center. Like if you double jump and hard drift for center, you get there, you get there. Like you get to skip multiple stages of the game. Because the idea Fox, is... Fox Fastball, Aerodosh to center. is the absolute classic. <laughs> <laughs> that is the American dream. Turn reality, dude. Yeah. Fox and Aerodosh. So, the idea is that generally once you hit this advantage, if your opponent is playing the game correctly, this should become a multi-stage boss fight where you have to... You have to basically win multiple dice rolls just to get them to open up the weak spot and play neutral again. And so if you can just skip right to that phase and get it reliably because your opponent's just slipping or isn't keeping their game honest, you got a stew going. So the idea is once you reach a higher level of play, it's about maintaining this noose and forcing your opponent to play the multi-stage boss battle every time they get it. And as Ramsey has mentioned earlier, uh, if your opponent is not capable of holding their multi-stage boss battle and you are they're gonna have to be so much better than you to win the game because you're just gonna be rolling like three four dice every time you win and they roll one when they win so like it's just like unless they're four times better than you they're not even gonna break it even and so the idea is uh, this is where a lot of our consistency at higher levels of play is coming from is just the essentially the players who can play this and the players who can't and the players who can't if they're not playing a character that is capable of hitting four times harder than their opponent's character, then that's pretty much that then and there. So the main places we want to look at are the points of stage where these reversals come up, especially the higher reward ones. And so we want to look at essentially the corner where you have uh, the furthest corner where you can essentially edge slip or you can run off or you can dash back to ledge roll distance unreactably. And then from here, you usually want to do something that you can while moving, because as Bam mentioned, if you are retreating something, it's usually easier for your opponent to react to where you're going to because you're creating space. Whereas if you're approaching them, it's harder to react because the space is closing and there's an adverse relationship between space and time. As the space increases, you have more time. As the space decreases, you have less time. And so the idea is you want to put out these attacks and then retreat so that the attack is as close as possible 
while then the follow-up position is going to give you as much space as possible so that you then have a time advantage on the follow-up that your opponent didn't have when they make their decision. And so you usually want to play this so that you then retreat back to a corner position. There is a spot on almost every single stage where the stage itself will, on the floor palette, have markings that you can actually look at to confirm where this is. So, like, for example, on Battlefield, there's, like, a swirl. On FD, there's, like, some air, a cluster of arrows pointing at it and then in the middle. And this is going to be right where ledge roll goes, and this should all position also position you so that you are perfectly going to have your opponents get up attacks with unless they play exactly like bowser link i forget if there's other characters cloud has a but, long one yeah cloud bowser link yeah mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. three other get up attack is going to basically uh phantom hit you if you stand at that same place and so this will position you so that you can essentially just shield to cover them bursting from ledge while also shield grabbing a ledge roll or while also being able to if you do shield and then they put out a ledge jump and mash out an aerial, then you'll find that when you stand in the same position on stages like PS2, Battlefield, where there's that platform, you're going to get the position that Charles was referring to at the beginning, where if they do that ledge jump aerial into you, they cannot cross you up. And if they can cross you mm -hmm. up, you're going to have like multiple seconds to react to it because they can't fast fall. So they're going to have to slow fall all the way past you. And so you can always react and actually make a correct decision more consistently because yep. they're giving you, or they're taking more time to cross the same amount of space that they would otherwise. And so that improves your decision making because you have more time to make a decision. And the more time you can consider something before choosing your answer, the more likely you are to make a good decision. And like, this is just a law of decision making. And then from there, they still have the other side of the platform, so they can just, uh, again, if they push their way into the under the roof, you just go to the other side of the building and you're still dry. And from this point on, uh, it comes down to what Bam mentioned before. It's not a matter of just being at center. It's a matter of each of these places is their own special place to be. And so if you leave a hitbox out where these places are, while you then move your hurt box away from it, then if your opponent is trying to take these strong places, because like I mentioned before, the more time you spend in these places without staying in one single place for too long, the more likely you are to win the game. That's just how it works. It's a correlation. And so you want to take away your opponent's ability to correlate into a win by just keeping them from these places, because if they're not in the good or best spaces, then they're inherently in worse spaces. And so if you're putting yourself in the best spaces or keeping your opponent from being in the best spaces, the natural evolution of the game is just going to be that unless one of you is significantly better than the other, the person who is in the best places more often probably wins. And so just going into the game, this essentially enables us to play proactively on neutral. And so this actually allows us to play a, an excellent risk-reward neutral game by just contesting these spaces so that the opponent can't have them and we occupy them on our way to cover them and you can't always keep it out but like we said before it's a matter of rolling four dice while your opponent just rolls one you don't actually have to force the hit it's not a matter of oh well this is just the time you should always go in if your opponent's right here that's when you attack it's going to be different for each player in each matchup like there's just so much nuance to it like we mentioned before different characters are capable of creating their own spots that they want to be like a snake can put down a C4 and all of a sudden he has a special place that he can defend that's not based on stage control. I'm afraid it's not based on stage choice. It's going to be relative to C4. And so this also comes down to when we're counterpicking stages, it's going to be a matter of relating to these things. So like I said before, it's like PS2 battlefields that are going to give you that platform. So if you know that your character likes to reversal from the ledge with a ledge jump aerial, you should probably avoid going to those stages and go to a stage like Town and City, where it still has outer platforms, but for most of the transformation, the platforms aren't going to interrupt this at all. And so you can ledge jump aerial and then put out a fast fall to make it ambiguous. Did you cross them up? Did you side switch them and go for that forward smash? They can't react to the difference. And so that opens up mix-ups that might not be unreactable otherwise. And so like, these are usually the things that we're looking for when we're looking at, well, what stage do I want to play in this matchup? It's a matter of, well, what specific positions are we looking for? What of these niche interactions are we doing to cut off our opponent's best places to be while we're cutting off our own, or sorry, placing on our own? And then how do the stage features affect our decisions to be here? 
because in some cases, if you really just like being under a platform, it, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Samus's specifically just really like these stages where they can run to the other platform and then charge their charge shot from there. They're like they know what places they want to be. Yes, they could do things better to make value of their movement from place to place. But the idea is that even without pushing Samus this extra degree, it's still enough to get them the results they need to get because at the end of the day, they're still posturing between one of two places they want to be. And the best two places they want to be are symmetrical. It's on the same spot on either side of the map, and they'll just mix up how they get there. So that's I specifically wanted to point that out just because I feel like that kind of converges on everything we've been talking about so far. Dude, I think that's super cool because what that naturally leads into as well is like, how do you properly break the rules? So like Charles said, right? It's like Spargo will nine out of 10 times keep you in the corner and at one time he will swing the back air. Why does he do that? Well, if you think about it, right? Like you can you can hold the center and then have like a win-win scenario, but hitting them from the center is not as rewarding as hitting them when they're in the corner because they're closer to the blast zone, they're closer off stage. So there's gonna be that moment where you get the right information and you can break the rules because you understand them. And it's the same for Samus, right? Like she can break the rules because of how she plays with them. When you charge charge shot, you're investing time in a stronger situation, in this case, having charge shot, instead of investing time moving around to a better like physical position. And at the end of the day, it all kind of comes back to that same core principle. Uh, or, you know, like like you discussed, Tony, it's, it's all about understanding, you know, which die to roll. Um, but there's always going to be exceptions. And if you if you get to a point where you can play the system so well that you know when not to play the system, that's where you really get the next level. And like a good example of that is like, um, and this is, this is uh, you know, we have zoners who create their own like quote unquote wing conditions, right? Because of their charging. But there's also like close quarter characters. So if you look at, for example, like Ryu or Ken players, they will often ledge trap not with the intention of transitioning into corner pressure per se, but they're trying to get that big hit because one, they have auto turnaround, which makes their coverage better. And two, their hits hit harder, right? Like Cloud Beckers you at 70 sucks, but it's all right. Ryu or Ken down tilts you at 70. That could be your stock. And so you get these situations where they break the rules because their character allows them to, because they understand the system well enough to know when to play it and when not to play it. So yeah, I think that's, Super awesome that you brought that up because I think it very naturally leads into, well, that's, you know, like that's the logical approach. That's the objective approach. And once you understand that, that's where you can really go a step further. Yep. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And that stuff's always sick, right? Because like we said, it starts off very simple, but then it's like you got to take into account, you know, not just your character, but their character, what they, what your opponent is able to do with that character. Cause not everyone's going to have, you know, those certain, um, like, either tactics or the tech down or the combos down right to take advantage of those things and it's like all taking all that into account and then uh like you said ramsey's just like then if it is a situation where you know it you know this so well then you are able to play off that information right exactly. and go on to certain ways where it's like you may look at it and it's like it may someone may be like oh well particularly well, why would you do that that's so wrong blah, 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 right and that's when you fall in those situations right it's so funny because you see that all the time, right? How many times have you read a YouTube comment and be like, what the hell? Why does Leo get away from <laughs> get away with that? Why does Spargo get away from that? No one la I don't get to land those. Every time I do it, when I'm in elite, like I, when I'm thin down, I'm an elite smash, that never lands. But he does it? Pfft, no way. These all they all suck. I guarantee you, <laughs> I can play them right now and I can top eight. I can just win this whole tournament. Because there's no way he's doing it when I do that. And then he wins. That's that stupid. Was, that was me at 16, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot there. of people. That's how, that's, that was a lot of people. That was yeah. a lot of people. Because they didn't you just understand. Don't understand. Uh, yeah. You don't know until you know. You right. Don't know until you know, man. Yeah. Well, my closing statements for stage controls, I'm really looking forward to how all levels of players really can kind of push this general concept to really big stocks, big wins, right? Um, we've seen so many top players develop the the meta of stage control to the point where, I mean, corner is such a big deal now. And we've really seen this concept of stage control evolve into a core a core fundamental part of Smash in general, like across all Smash games. So really interesting stuff. 
And I hope you guys enjoyed this topic. If you guys did enjoy the video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and make sure to let us know in the comments what kind of topics you want us to go over, what kind of guests you want to see on the show. But until next time, class dismissed.